It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this talk is, What is Public Health? There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include review the definition of public health, review primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, and how primary prevention is the primary mission of public health. Review the six eras of public health history. Discuss the health promotion disease prevention model. Discuss the need to couple individual responsibility with community and population health. Review the five public health values. Review the three core public health functions. Review the 10 essential services of public health and discuss the lifespan impact of public health in the 20th century. When asked what public health is, people often have varying responses, including public health is taking care of poor people. Public health is washing your hands. Public health is protecting the water and air. Public health is making sure food is safe to eat, etc. Public health is all of those things, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The field of public health is broad, covering food and drug safety, environmental controls, disease control, preventing diseases like tuberculosis or measles, vaccinations, prevention and response to disasters, etc. The health and wellness of the whole population is the primary mission of public health. The following is a definition that defined public health in the 20th century. Public health is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through organized community effort. The 21st century is associated with several changes that impact the current definition, including prolonged life associated with quality of life, protection of health linked with promoting health when it's at risk, a new definition of community with the advent and expansion of social media, new communication technologies, expansion of public health and clinical interventions, enhanced evidence-based research and data, focus on harms, costs, and benefits of interventions, and the essential need for more collaboration and partnerships to improve health and wellness outcomes. A current working definition of public health for the 21st century could be the totality of all evidence-based public and private efforts that preserve and promote health and prevent disease disability and death. This definition broadens the public health mission to address all the determinants of health, social, economic, physical, spiritual, and environmental. To do this, public health will need to collaborate and partner more than we have in the past. Working in traditional silos will not accomplish the expanded 21st century mission of public health. Let's spend a few minutes discussing the three types of prevention, including primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary prevention is eliminating risk factors that cause disease. Primary prevention would be vaccinations for measles, hepatitis A, tetanus, human papillomavirus, etc., to prevent a person from getting the disease. It would also be the result of effective tobacco prevention education programs, preventing smoking related to diseases like cancer, chronic lung disease, and cardiovascular disease. Public health is the only health profession with the primary mission of primary prevention. Secondary prevention is the detection, treatment, and curing of disease. 
An example of secondary prevention would be the diagnosing of tuberculosis in a patient via a skin test, chest x-ray, and sputum culture. Then treating the patient with anti-tuberculous antibiotics resulting in a cure. Another example would be the detection of an inguinal hernia during a routine physical exam. Subsequently, performing a herniorophy or hernia surgery and curing the patient of his or her inguinal hernia. Tertiary prevention is associated with individuals who have been damaged by a disease and receive an intervention to mitigate the disability associated with that disease. They will never be cured. Hospice care for terminally ill patients would also fall into tertiary prevention. Secondary and tertiary prevention are the primary mission of clinical care systems and professionals. The Institute of Medicine in 2012 recommended the enhanced integration of public health and primary care to meet the health and wellness needs of the population. Let's review a brief history of public health. There are essentially six eras of public health history, including one, health protection, two, hygiene movement, three, contagious disease control, four, filling medical care system holes, five, health promotion and disease prevention, and six, population health. Let's first consider the health protection era. The health protection era lasted from antiquity to the 1830s. The earliest civilizations integrated their concepts of prevention into their culture, religion, and laws. Some cultures prohibited or strongly discouraged eating certain foods, Jewish culture with pork, Indian subcontinent cultures with beef, and East African tribes like the Maasai with fish. Cannibalism was nearly universally prohibited by most cultures. One possible reason could have been that cannibalism practiced by certain tribes was noted to be associated with central nervous system dementing fatal diseases. Kuru could have been one of those diseases. It was scientifically identified in the 1950s in the Foray people of New Guinea, one of the rare tribes who ate human brains as part of a funeral ritual. Some cultures prohibited or limited the use of alcohol to control unwanted behaviors. Some sexual activities thought associated with poor health resulted in various religious, cultural, and legal practices including premarital abstinence, marital fidelity, and ritualistic male and female circumcision. Quarantine, or the practice of separating afflicted individuals from others, was often used. Quarantine was used to hopefully control the Black Plague in Europe. Plague was one of the most devastating pandemics in human history, resulting in the deaths of an estimated 75 to 200 million people in Eurasia, peaking in Europe from 1347 to 1351. Plague is caused by a bacteria, Yersinia pestis. During the epidemic, a form of quarantine called cordon sanitaire was used, which barred outsiders from entering walled European cities. Unfortunately, Cordon sanitaire was not effective since plague was passed by rats and their fleas, not by human to human contact. Having adequate science would have greatly helped control this epidemic. Quarantine was used by some cultures to control leprosy. The biblical book of Leviticus, chapter 13 describes the ancient Jewish protocol for diagnosing and handling leprosy, including quarantine. If anyone notices a swelling in his skin, or a scab, 
or a boil or pimple with transparent skin, leprosy is to be suspected. He must be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons for the spot to be examined. If the hair in the spot turns white, and if the spot looks to be more than skin deep, it is leprosy, and the priest must declare him a leper. If a man is burned in some way, and the burn place becomes bright reddish white or white, then the priest must examine the spot. If the hair in the bright spot turns white, and the problem seems to be more than skin deep, it is leprosy that is broken out from the burn, and the priest must pronounce him a leper. Anyone who is discovered to have leprosy must tear his clothes and let his hair grow in wild disarray and cover his upper lip and call out as he goes, I am a leper, I am a leper. As long as the disease lasts, he is defiled and must live outside the camp, a fairly severe form of quarantine and stigmatization. If leprosy is suspected in a woolen or linen garment or fabric, or in a piece of leather or leather work, and there is a greenish or a reddish spot in it, it is probably leprosy and must be taken to the priest to be examined. The priest will put it away for seven days and look at it again on the seventh day. If the spot is spread, it is a contagious leprosy and he must burn the clothing, fabric, linen, or woolen covering, or leather article, for it is contagious and must be destroyed by fire. We know that the presence of white hair is relatively common on wound edges due to the damage of pigmented cells. There are many non-leprous and non-contagious causes of the conditions described in Leviticus 13. The biblical use of the term leprosy applied to many skin afflictions, not just Hansen's disease caused by Mycobacteria leprae, a relative of tuberculosis. The use of quarantine in these passages is excessively aggressive and once again underlines the importance of science in making good, informed public health decisions. In 1740, a British naval commander, James Lind, discovered that providing sailors with lemons and other citrus fruits during long voyages prevented scurvy. The picture shows the bleeding gums and periodontal problems associated with scurvy. He was providing vitamin C, even though vitamins had not yet been identified. Edward Jenner was an English physician who developed the world's first vaccine. The terms vaccine and vaccination are derived from variola vaccinae, the virus that causes the pox-like illness in cattle. Vaccinia was the term Jenner used to denote the cowpox illness. He used cowpox from infected pustules from cattle in 1796 to vaccinate people, starting with a dairymaid named Sarah Nelms. These vaccinations prevented smallpox when vaccinated individuals were exposed to people who had disease. Jenner is called the father of immunology. His work is said to have saved more lives than the work of any other human. In Jenner's time, smallpox killed around 10% of the general population with that number as high as 20% in towns and cities where infections spread more easily. The lower picture on this slide demonstrates the classic rash of smallpox. All of these approaches to disease prevention were used before organized public health existed. Public health awareness started to grow in Europe and the United States in the mid 1800s with the idea that social conditions of inequality were associated with health and wellness issues. Introducing the concept of social justice and public health's focus on vulnerable populations.
Next, let's consider the hygiene movement era for a few minutes. This era had a focus on sanitation, even though the germ theory had not yet been developed. The fundamental concepts of epidemiology developed during this period. John Snow, who lived from 1800 to 1899, was an anesthesiologist by training. John Snow is known as the father of the field of epidemiology. He studied the cholera epidemic in London and identified the cause, contaminated water associated with the Broad Street pump circled on the map. Each mark on the map is the physical location of a case of cholera and helped Snow deduce that the pump was essentially the geographic center of the epidemic and could likely be the culprit. His method was what is termed in epidemiology a natural experiment that is still commonly used today. A natural experiment is defined as a naturally occurring circumstance in which subsets of a population have different levels of exposure to a supposed causal factor in a situation resembling an actual experiment where human subjects would be randomly allocated to groups. This slide lists the major contributions John Snow made to the field of epidemiology, including the powers of observation and written expression, description of epidemiologic methods, including mapping and data tables to describe the outbreak, the use of the natural experiment epidemiologic method, developing recommendations based on the data, using that data to develop a practical solution to the problem. In this case, remove the pump handle, which Snow did. His actions quickly terminated the epidemic. This picture is the famous Broad Street pump with the handle removed. There were other events that impacted the hygiene movement in the mid 1800s. Semmelweis was an Austrian physician who sought to control puerperal fever or fever during childbirth. Puerperal fever was a major cause of maternal mortality in Europe and the United States. Semmelweis noted the association of puerperal fever with physicians who went straight from the autopsy room to the delivery room without washing their hands. He instituted strict hand washing and documented a dramatic decline in puerperal fever in his institution. Unfortunately, his practice was not adopted by medical colleagues until the germ theory was later described by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. Vital statistics of birth and death records were developed in England in the mid 1800s. Vital statistics established a basis for population-wide assessment of health status. From the onset, there was a spirited discussion over how to define the cause of death. Edwin Chadwick argued for specific pathologic conditions or diseases as the causal basis, where William Farr argued for underlying risk factors, including social conditions, as the real cause of death. The American Public Health Association, APHA, was formed in 1872 and identified two main goals. One, advocacy for scientific advances related to the health of the public, and two, public education to improve community health. Let's now consider the contagious disease control era. This era ran from approximately 1880 to the 1940s. Identification of the germ theory was the major focus of this period. Louis Pasteur identified and postulated that germs caused several diseases as early as 1860. The practical application of that theory related to the work of Robert Koch in 1890. Koch proposed four postulates that defined infectious causes of disease. 
This slide lists the four Koch postulates. One, the same microorganisms are present in every case of a disease. Two, the microorganisms are isolated from the tissues of a dead animal and a pure culture is prepared. Three, microorganisms from the pure culture are inoculated into a healthy, susceptible animal. The disease is reproduced in that animal. Four, the identical microorganisms are isolated and recultivated from the tissue specimens of the experimental animal. This era also saw the merging of the new field of epidemiology started by John Snow's work, germ theory and immunology, resulting in public programs to control infectious diseases like tuberculosis. Scientists could now identify tuberculosis by a skin test, culture, and chest x-ray. Many tuberculosis sanatoriums were developed during this period of public health history. New toxin vaccines against tetanus and diphtheria were developed. Without antibiotics, control of infectious diseases was the priority with public health focusing on prevention, isolation, and case finding to further prevent spread. In the early 20th century, Dr. Joseph Goldberger, a physician in the U.S. government's hygienic laboratory, the predecessor of the National Institutes of Health, identified the cause of pellagra, a vitamin B6 or niacin deficiency, in poor southern sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and mill workers due to deficient diets. Pellagra causes skin, mucosal, and mental symptoms and signs. His work contradicted medical thinking of the time that attributed the cause to an infectious agent. The link of pellagra to poverty underlined the importance of the social determinants of health and social justice in public health. The 1920s and 30s saw significant advances, not only in the understanding of contagious diseases, but also in vitamin and nutrition research. The next era is filling medical care system holes, which extended from the 1940s to approximately the mid-1980s. Penicillin was discovered in 1928 by Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming, but wasn't used in human medicine until 1942. The introduction and development of antibiotic therapy allowed clinicians to cure many infectious diseases. During this period, public health helped integrate preventive services into clinical practice. Randomized clinical trials emerged. The Food and Drug Administration developed the foundations for evidence-based public health and medicine. Epidemiological methods were developed for non-communicable diseases resulting in the 1964 Dr. Luther Terry Surgeon General's report linking tobacco use to cancer, and the 1948 Framingham study linking high blood pressure, cholesterol, cigarette smoking, and obesity to cardiovascular disease. The Framingham study is currently evaluating its third cohort. Smallpox was officially recognized as eradicated in 1980. Eliminating smallpox was an incredible public health achievement. The last naturally acquired case was seen in Somalia in 1977. The last laboratory related death from smallpox virus was in 1978 at the University of Birmingham, England, where they had six cases and three deaths. In 1980, the World Health Assembly of the World Health Organization certified the global eradication of smallpox. Eradication was not achieved by mass vaccination, but by a ring vaccination technique. There were three components to the ring vaccination concept. 
One, isolation of confirmed and suspected cases to prevent further spread. Two, identification, vaccination, and surveillance of significant contacts of proven cases, the first ring to further prevent spread. Three, vaccination of household contacts of contacts, the second ring or safety net. Smallpox immunization is 95 to 99 percent effective in preventing disease in those exposed. That's good, but not 100 percent. Therefore, the second ring was felt essential. Mass vaccination was considered an adjunct measure if indicated. Routine smallpox vaccination was discontinued in the U.S. in 1972 and generally discontinued in the world in 1982. The U.S. military discontinued vaccination in 1990. Select vaccination was reinstituted post 9-11 due to bioterrorism concerns. The next era is health promotion and disease prevention. This era lasted from approximately the mid 1980s to 2000 and focused on individual responsibility. Health promotion and disease prevention targeted individuals to affect behavioral change and reduce risk factors associated with disease. This would include cardiovascular risk factors identified in the Framingham study, high blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, and obesity. Behavioral change strategies were also used to help prevent the spread of HIV AIDS. Health promotion was defined by the World Health Organization's Bangkok Charter for Health Promotion in a Globalized World as the process of enabling people to increase control over their health and its determinants and thereby improve their health, emphasizing the concept of individual responsibility. This slide is a representation of Pender's health promotion model. The first column lists personal and historical influences on behaviors, including prior experiences and personal biological, psychological, and socio-cultural factors. The middle column lists some specific cognitive influences, including a person's perceptions of benefits, barriers, efficacy, and activity-related impacts. Interpersonal influences of family, peers, models, societal and community norms, etc., situational influences, and immediate competing demands also have an impact as diagrammed. All of these influences ultimately impact individual decisions and the final output, health-related behaviors. Health promotion and disease prevention strategies aim at neutralizing negative and enhancing positive influences of this model. Screening efforts were emphasized in this era, like mammography to detect early breast cancer and pap smears for cervical cancer. Newborn screening for various genetic diseases was also implemented. Environmental movements enhanced public awareness of lead in gasoline and paint radon, holes in the ozone atmospheric layer, air pollution, etc. Reductions in air pollution and smoking had positive impacts on chronic lung disease, asthma, and coronary artery disease. That brings us to the final and current era of public health history, population health. Population health is transforming the way professionals and the public think about health. Community-wide or population-wide public health efforts are needed to address issues like bioterrorism, the opioid crisis, the high cost of health care, access to health care, control of pandemic influenza, HIV AIDS, suicide, disparities, climate change, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, environmental contamination, international health issues, etc. 
The new public health paradigm is individual responsibility coupled with community and population health. So from that history, public health values, core functions, and essential services should make sense. We'll start with values, since it's upon those deeper cultural layers of public health beliefs and values that public health functions and essential services are built. The American Public Health Association has identified five key values that represent public health practice. These values have propelled public health for nearly 150 years and continue to form the skeletal backbone of the field. Those five values include one, community. We believe we have greater potential for impact when we create community to solve problems, share new ideas, and explore different perspectives. Community engagement skills and competencies are essential for public health practice. Two, science and evidence-based decision-making. The best policies and practices are ones based on research with evidence that demonstrates effectiveness. The best innovations come from testing new ideas and approaches. Not all best practices have been identified. There will always be a need for innovation. This is especially true for rural areas and special population groups. Three, health equity. We believe in conditions that give everyone the opportunity to reach their best health. This requires valuing all individuals and populations equally. It means addressing inequities in places where people are born, grow, live, work, learn, and age. When will we know we have succeeded? When health disparities are eliminated. Four, prevention and wellness. Preventing disease and injury mitigating the impact of disasters through preparedness and ensuring an environment where the healthy choice is the easy choice are worthwhile investments that lead to an overall improved human condition. Five, real progress in improving health. Our effort must result in forward movement in health impact. Sometimes that is a leap forward other times, it's small steps, but always, it is real progress. These are a good set of public health values upon which to build a strong, equitable, effective public health system and practice. This slide lists the three core public health functions, including one, the assessment and monitoring of the health of communities and populations at risk to identify health problems and priorities. To accomplish this function, enhanced collaboration and partnership between academic institutions and public health departments is required. Health departments are generally data rich, but have limited capacity to research and analyze that data. On the other hand, Academic institutions have that research and analysis capability, but often limited access to data. A marriage between academia and practice is beneficial to both parties. Two, the formulation of public policies designed to solve identified local and national health problems and priorities. Public health professionals must position themselves to appropriately advocate with policymakers. Three, to assure that all populations have access to appropriate and cost-effective care, including health promotion, disease prevention services, population and community health programs, and evaluation of the effectiveness of those services and programs. To accomplish this function, enhanced collaboration and partnership with a variety of stakeholders, including healthcare systems, is essential. Public health can't provide the resources necessary 
to plug all access gaps to services and programs. Finally, the five public health values and three core functions translate into the 10 essential public health services identified in 1994 by the Core Public Health Functions Steering Committee. The committee included representatives from U.S. public health service agencies and other major public health organizations. The 10 essential services include, one, monitor health status to identify and solve community health problems. Two, diagnose and investigate health problems and health hazards in the community. Three, inform, educate, and empower people about health issues. Four, mobilize community partnerships and action to identify and solve health problems. Five, Develop policies and plans that support individual and community health efforts. Six, enforce laws and regulations that protect health and ensure safety. Seven, link people to needed personal health services and assure the provision of health care when otherwise unavailable. Eight, assure competent public and personal health care workforce. Nine, evaluate effectiveness, accessibility, and quality of personal and population-based health services. 10, research for new insights and innovative solutions to health problems. This is what we do in public health. Our actions and behaviors that support the three functions and five values of public health. So does public health actually work or is it all theory? The CDC demonstrated that the lifespan of Americans increased by approximately 30 years from 1900 to 1999. 25 of those years were due to public health interventions. Five years could be attributed to healthcare advances, including medications like antibiotics, surgical technology, or life support. The 10 health achievements that significantly impacted lifespan in the 20th century included vaccinations, the most effective public health tool in history, motor vehicle safety, safer workplaces, control of infectious diseases, including water protection, sanitation, etc. Declines in cardiovascular heart disease and stroke deaths. Safer and healthier foods. Healthier mothers and babies. Family planning. Fluoridation of water. And recognizing tobacco as a health hazard. Many of these achievements were accomplished through public health professionals working in collaboration with other stakeholders, including healthcare colleagues. Effectively applying the three functions and 10 essential services previously discussed will continue to positively impact the public's health and wellness in the 21st century as it had in the last century. In summary, the mission of public health is to effectively address all the social determinants of health. Primary prevention is the primary mission of public health. Public health practice progressively evolved through the six historical eras. Health promotion and disease prevention strategies aim at neutralizing negative and enhancing positive influences on behavior. Public health values and functions express themselves in the 10 essential public health services. In the United States, public health was responsible for 25 of the 30 years of increased lifespan noted during the 20th century. Take your public health practice skills to the next level. 
Our specialized certificate courses give you an opportunity to work systematically through a public health topic and demonstrate your understanding of that material in a capstone project. Learn more and sign up at ndphtn.com certificates.